Eric Champa Eng. Almost correct. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a hand, will you? Thank you. Thank you. It's really great to be here, and it's really great to see so many of you uh, Qt developers in, in one place again. Um, professionally, Qt and Trolltech, uh, they're by far the, the biggest things I've done in my life. And for me, there's a lot of emotion around Qt. And I have to admit, uh, this summer, it didn't look too good for, uh, for my professional baby. And um, I want to use this opportunity to thank Digia for the faith they put in Qt, for the investment they're doing, and for the risk they're taking, that we now have someone who's taking Qt forward. And also want to thank ICS and KDAB for picking up the glove and organizing the developer days. So that was very, very important. You've also taken a big financial risk doing this. So thank you. Thank you. And especially I want to thank Kalle at KDAB for approaching me, uh, dragging me out, getting some dust off of me, and, and getting me down here to Berlin. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And also want to thank uh, Jesper at KDAB. He had the idea for the topic of this talk. He's a very nice guy over here who decides how long I'm able to speak today. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, bring you back in time and hopefully give you a few cute surprises. Um, back to a distant time where I looked like this. <laughs> this photo has been taken uh, in July 95, about a month and a half after we released Qt 0.90, which was the first external uh, version of Qt. Uh, and we were three on the team. We were uh, myself and Holvarn Wood, who started Trolltech, who created the very first internal versions of Qt. And then we had Arndt Gulbrandsen, who joined us in March, April of that year, 95. So here you have Hovard, <laughs> co-founder, my best friend, very great guy. And then Arndt, which we were lucky enough to, to hire after, after one year. Fantastic uh, programmer. He ran the whole developer relations things from day one. He designed the whole documentation system. We had no idea what to do about documentation. He, uh, he did that. I remember when we were only three, uh, we got an email to support which said, to Arndt and all his programmers, which uh, spoke loudly about all the stuff that guy managed to do. That photo is a bit serious, so I have to balance it with, with this one. So this, is, <laughs> this is also uh, Arndt. So move um, two years forward, 1997, uh, there were six of us. So here is the Trolltech team. Now, would you have invested? <laughs> So from the left, uh, we have Eirik uh, Ovitslan, then we have Paolo Altrete, myself, and in the back, Warwick Allison, who came all the way from Australia to work from Trolltech. All we had to do was to send them an email, and then we picked them up at the airport, halfway around the world. And then we have Hovard in, in the front there. Note the brainstorming on the, on the whiteboard in the background. I think we're very creative that day. So this is from the, from the Christmas party. Um, two more uh, years. Uh, and then we added a couple of more people, a very, very important guy for us, called Matthias Ettrich, the founder of uh, KDE, ingenious developer, driving force for many years. He was chief of development for, for Qt, the brain behind Qt4 and, and many, many other things in, in Qt. Very talented, multi-talented guy. Among other things, he's a very good piano player. I don't think cow milking is his thing since he's using a small plastic glass here, but he's trying anyway. And then uh, we had Sue, and she did the marketing, the sales, the accounting, the lunch, treating us well, learning us manners and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, this is taken in 2001 when Trolltech and Qt were green. But before that, Trolltech's color was blue. So for the first six years, Trolltech was blue. And this is the um, first uh, front page of the website from uh, Wayback Machine from December 96. And then we got a logo down there. 
And this is actually uh, was a suggestion for a CD cover. In the beginning, well, in the beginning, we only transferred over the internet, but some people worked in companies where they had to have a physical thing, you know, to put a sticker on or something, and it was their property. So people uh, insisted on getting something. So we did diskettes in the beginning, and then we moved to CDs. But this one was never used. Uh, we thought it looked too much like sperm swimming through the, through the queue there, so <laughs> it didn't make it through the QA department. <laughs> and um, we were called Troll Space Tech in the beginning. And even back then, we started doing uh, partnership programs. So you see here, Kala is being well treated at, at our booth. And uh, we also built the developer community. And we quickly figured out the two most important factors for getting partners and developers for your product. And they are alcohol <laughs> and giveaway t-shirts. <laughs> and this one we actually did. This was a, a t-shirt that we produced in, in quite a number of, uh, of um, t-shirts. OK, let's move into the technical stuff. This is, I think, the equivalent of a cave painting for, for Cute. This is the first design sketch that Hovar faxed to me on the 28th of October, 1993. I was working at a company in Oslo, and he was doing his thesis in Vienna, and he was sitting there designing. And both of us in previous jobs had created, uh, each of us, a separate C++ uh, GUI toolkit. So we had that experience, and, and we used that in, in the design. Um, let's zoom in a bit. So you see over here uh, what was called viewport. That eventually became the, the Q Painter. Uh, we had the Q object up there. We had a uh, Q connection. Meta object system, we have the mock from, from day one, the whole idea behind the single and slot uh, system. And then the object couldn't have any children. And this was the way everyone else was doing it back then. We had looked at several other professional toolkits. There were many of them at, at the time. And there was a Q part inheriting from Q object could have children. And then there was a window which could do things in the windowing system. And then the event context handled the, the event loop. And uh, then we had the widget, which was a user interface element inheriting from object and event context, but it couldn't have any children. So we had to have a queue view on the other side, which was like a dialogue, which was, was a window on the screen, which could have children. And we were really struggling with this design. And we saw that all the competition was doing it. And it seems so obvious now, but it was a big design breakthrough in, in Qt when we realized that the queue object and the queue part should be put together. We, were, we had split it up too much to become the queue object. And then eventually the, the queue window, event context, view, and widget were split into the paint device and, and the queue widget. And the big thing was that we avoided parallel inheritance hierarchies in, in doing that. So that was a big thing. Uh, I also have to mention, some of you might have been there when I took part in the quiz at the Dev Days. I think it was 2007. And I was put on the spot, asked which classes do Q widgets inherit from? And I got a total brain blackout. You know, I had been programming for like five years or something. And eventually, it came out of me, Q object and Q event context. And a lot of people laughed because, of course, it was the paint device. No excuse for that. I mean, terrible. It's horrible. I wanted to dig myself into a hole. But at least this is not an excuse, but an explanation. Once there was a time when QWidget inherited from event context and Q object, <laughs> but only two people in the world knew about it. <laughs> me, me and Hovan. OK, then uh, I'm going to talk about different things and aspects of, of Qt. Uh, I want to talk about single slot access specifiers, You know, private, protected public, and I mean it, singles and slots. Let's look at the slots first. Uh, these are the two connect functions, which most of you probably know. You have the one which is in a, a queue object, which takes three arguments, where the this pointer counts as, as receiver. And then there's this one down here, which is static, where you can connect objects not necessarily being inside the, the class where you're doing the, the connection. Uh, we had these out. Um, in the first public releases. And it happened to be that it was my job after a while uh, to put in checks for access specifiers, because that was something that we didn't do just to get the releases out in the beginning. So you would think that when you have private protected and public slots, then you would not be allowed to connect to a private slot if you're outside the class where that's defined, right? That's what 
the whole point of access specifiers is. But then when I sat down and it was just on my to-do list before a release to do this, I sort of just, oh, stopped when I came to this one down here. Because you can't. You don't know who's calling it. It's a static global function. And we discussed, OK, should we then say that you can only connect to public ones, but then you break all the programs created when you actually use this one from inside the class where the slot's been, been defined or when you've inherited. So we decided, better not talk about it. Let's just keep it that way. So still today, there is no check for access specifier as a slot. You can make as many private slots as you want, and you can connect to them from wherever you want. It's just part of the syntax, but they don't work. So I hope DJ is not going to kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, people tend to do it correctly, but still, there, there is actually no check. Uh, Lars has claimed to me that with a new template system for uh, connections in 5.0, it will be possible. I don't believe it until I see it, but I'm looking forward to that email from Lars when he's fixed it. Single access specifiers. In the beginning, we thought it was a good idea to have private, protected, and public signals. And uh, that was the case from 060, which was the first one, first release we tagged but kept internal, until 0.90. And 0.90 was our first external release. We had been working day and night for three weeks to get this thing ready. And as you all know, before release, there's lots of stuff coming up. And I know from the old commit logs that we were sitting on the 20th of May at 11 p.m. having done the, what we thought were the last commits. It was me, Hovar, and Arndt. Hovar went home, and Arndt and I were standing behind just to uh, make the packages. And for some reason, it dawned on me when we did that that this was a really bad idea. Because it was very important for us to have the abstraction of a component, which is sort of the idea behind the object system. And if you allow people to make public signals, then that's a bad thing. Because signals are supposed to uh, tell you about a state's change inside the object. So you don't want someone outside to be able to emit a signal. That breaks the model. And once you make that possible, you're not going to get good components. So I discussed it with Arndt. And I said, we have to remove those. And the only thing that makes sense is to make them always protected. So we sat down. I re-implemented the mock. Arndt rewrote the uh, documentation. Uh, we rewrote all the example code and, and all the usage of, uh, of signals in Qt. And we uh, made sure it compiled and created the packages, released them on SunSite, and went home to sleep. So QA was uh, not at the same standards back then as it <laughs> is, is, is today. We were lucky. It worked. And it was, was the right decision, very important. Otherwise, we would have had these signals that... Uh, wouldn't have been good for, for the future of, of Qt. And when I'm talking about that, I have to add that um, back then, when you put things on Sun site, the FTP site, um, you would also uh, post a message to Comp OS Linux uh, announce, which was moderated. So it would take some days for that to get through. So we just put it in incoming on Sun site and thought no one knew about it. And then after 24 hours, we got an email from this Australian guy, Warwick Allison saying, great toolkits, but you don't have a slider view. And then he sent us 500 lines of working source code with a slider view class, 24 hours after we put it on this, this site. He'd just been LSing on incoming, looking if there was something there. <laughs> so that was his, the first contribution. And, uh, and later, we, of course, we hired the guy. <laughs> now, I think this sort of gives you the backdrop for the little error that we made in the LSM file when we uh, released Qt 090. Because there was a small typo, and it said maintain my <laughs> cute butts. <laughs> and that thing haunted us for over five years. We kept getting bug reports to cute butts at Trollerana. <laughs> so we had to have an Elias for five years. <laughs> OK, let's go into um, a case. Sorry? They are. Interesting. Very interesting. OK. Let's look at um, another thing, loading X11 font names. That was a hassle. Back before 2001, when XFT came out, the only way to get access to the available fonts was to call this function, xListFonts. And it gave you back uh, an array of these strange coded strings. 
these have fixed here is the font family and 16 is the point size 160 is the pixel size and it gets, gets you the resolution 72 times 72 uh, the the encoding and stuff like that and you would get one of these for every font instantiation so a bold would be different from a normal would be different from an italic would be different from a bold italic etc so you get these these lists and the worst part of this function was the max names you had to tell the X servers the maximum number of fonts you wanted back. And then the X server would allocate this array for you. And memory was really scarce back then. I mean, you counted in Ks. So how do you solve that? You had no idea how many fonts were on there, but you wanted them all. So this is a solution. This again ha happened to be me implementing this. So we started at 256. And if there were more, we would just release the, the array and then double it and go uh, around in this loop and until you know we had all the fonts in there and we had to stop somewhere so i just by chance said okay three two seven six eight, 32k yeah that makes sense so you can ask why didn't we just ask for the 32 seven six eight well that was the memory i mean if those were 16-bit pointers you would allocate 64k memory you wanted to do didn't want to do that and if they were god forbid 32-bit you would you would steal 128k uh, of memory so 2.0 came around, and we had more memory available. So we would just ask for 32767, and that would be freed pretty quickly. Anyway, still a big hassle. So um, many years later, I just happened to, for fun, have a look at GTK, which was the competition that showed up after this. Uh, you know, the, the, the GNOME uh, guys, they would uh, split out the, the GTK toolkit from, from the GIMP. And in the beginning, it didn't have a font database, but that showed up in, I think, 1.1.2. So I had a look at the font code. And this is what I found. They also do 32767. I wonder how they chose that number. And then, <laughs> I'm not saying there's a connection here. And I love this comment. I think this limit may have been set because of a limit in GTK list. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> But it does say, you know, something about software development. And I think people looking at other people's code is a good thing. That's what innovation is all about. That's what we did. We looked at all the other toolkits, you know, to learn. So it's a good thing. But, you know, you get these effects. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about Q method. That was actually a, a question I got from, uh, from Jesper when he suggested this, this talk. Because... Um, from the very beginning, in the, the single slot uh, part of the meta object system, um, we had defined three types of, uh, of meta object uh, functions that could be registered. It was single slot and method. But method was never used. It was meant to be used for scripting. So you could choose some of the function that you could use in, in, in a scripting system, but we never got around to it, never got the time to actually make it scriptable back then. In, in the beginning. So uh, what happened to these then? Well, we got an email from Jesper, support uh, 2002, and then Holweid uh, answered, this is funny. Method is a leftover from the old days, and it was never used. I didn't know it still existed in the header file. We'll probably remove it in an upcoming Qt release. So I had a look at 5 beta, and look here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You just ruined the good jokes in my trainings now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's probably in beta 2 also. <laughs> I mean, not only has it been kept, you know, it, it, it's been upgraded to the latest way of defining the macros. It's even the cute no keywords around it. No one's ever dared to remove it. It's never used. So the scripting finally was implemented. A different system was created, and Q invocable was, was the macro. And this just stayed around, you know. OK. Let's go over to the, the fun part, Easter eggs in Qt. So were there any Easter eggs in Qt? I mean, you're not supposed to put Easter eggs in a library because then suddenly all your customers have Easter eggs in their applications, right? So it's, it's a bad idea, but you know, being geeks and developers, we couldn't resist. So uh, we put some stuff in. Uh, XPM, a wonderful uh, image format that is uh, text-based. Um, and we added support for it in Qt 1.2 came out in April 97. 
And here you can see uh, some code uh, deeply hidden inside the system where you get the, the color name. Now it's an indexed image format, so you have a text string with all the pixels, and then you have ASCII characters uh, coding for the pixels. And when you have more than 64 colors, you get this code running, and it says if index equals one, if it's the first color in the table, then you change the index to 64 times 44 plus 21 plus one, I wonder. And if you actually get that index, you do that with a one, so you swap the two indexes. Now, uh, who can guess which character uh, 44 codes for? Any ideas? It's a capital Q. It's a capital Q and a small t. So if you write uh, XPM image files, you'll get the first color named cute. Nifty. So I checked the 5.0 beta, and it's still there. <laughs> so someone even has taken the time to comment. The following four lines are a joke. Cool. OK, demo time. So in my research for uh, this presentation, I uh, installed um, the latest version of Ubuntu uh, in my Parallels desktop. I wanted to do SUSE, but I had a uh, little bit of challenge with that. But that's been, been fixed. But still, I'm going to run it on Ubuntu. Let's make a symlink here. Yeah, here you can see the, the ones I actually found. I Unfortunately, uh, the revision control system uh, at Trolltex changed so many times, from RCS to CVS to Perforce to JIT, that a lot of the tags and history ha has been lost, unfortunately. So I had to go out on the net to search for packages and actually fi found 1.2. It's the oldest one I found with source. Uh, everything uh, before 140 except 1.2 and 1.33 has been lost. So if anyone out there has packages or knows where I can find them, I'd be very, very grateful. And then we can revive some of the old, old cool stuff. But at least one two is not bad, you know. It's um, it's sorry about that. It's um, April uh, 1997, which is still, you know, old times. So let's go into examples here and show image. Okay, I want to remove that thing there. Oh, I can't resist just showing you the code here. I have thrown it in the terminal, otherwise I won't recognize anything. So just to show off, I just put in a, a label and a push button and connected it. And this is a, the first cute code I've written in about 10 years, so just to show you that. Which gives us the good old show image example, reading then a PPM file. Hey! So this is actually a 120. I had to do three small uh, changes to the source code, and it ran. This is running on the last version of G++, last version of libraries, everything. So it was some pretty bit rot resistant stuff. So all I'm doing here is just creating the XCM, XPM file for that image. And let's have a look at it. And up here, lo and behold, we have a color called cute. <laughs> here. <laughs> and let's look at the image down here. A lot of cute. A lot of cute in the beginning. <laughs> it's a pretty geeky Easter egg, I have to admit. I have to admit. OK. Yeah, I wanted to show you also the good old widgets example running. Cool, huh? And um, this is running in the beautiful motif style, which was a standard back then. And uh, there's a small Easter egg here also, actually, because back then, having an image in a list box was unheard of, but we could do it. And of course, it's line 42, containing the image of Qt, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> now, the very first versions of Qt actually supported three operating systems. Most people know about Unix, Linux, and Windows, but we also supported OS 2. Because everyone thought that was going to be a big platform back then. So we had the OS 2 style also, uh, which was working beautifully in the first versions. Unfortunately, by 1.2, Bitrot had started to set in. 
Uh, but there's still some remnants of it, actually. So I can show you that. Uh oh. So you can see here there are some missing pix maps and buttons are flat and stuff, but at least you have the very gorgeous combo boxes from OS2 working. It's still there. So if anyone can find me those old packages, we can revive the OS2 demos. Okay. Something else you probably didn't know. We actually had a project porting Qt to the PlayStation 1 because we thought about uh, turning it into some sort of application platform, set-top box, multimedia system, etc. So we had it running, which was quite a feat because you can't get access to the frame buffer on the PlayStation 1. You only have these vector commands to the graphics card to do things on the screen. Unfortunately, Sony were never interested in doing anything about it, so that version died. Okay, let's look at a true Easter egg. Thank you. This is from 2.0, from QMessageBox CPP. There are a couple of lines here, a bit hidden in the code. There's one under um, an icon encoded in this beautiful XPM format again, uh, which seems to say something about the end of the text or something. It's called QDENTEXT, and it's defined as Qt dialog default key. Then way further down in the file, just after the about Qt text, it's actually used. And it's making a call to QMessageBox about Qt, which is the dialog box you probably know saying uh, something about Qt. And it's given the, the title egg, but it's even coded so that you can't uh, grep after egg. It's split in, into three. And then this beautiful code is in QApplication X11 CPP. This is the brainchild of Warwick Allison, our ingenious um, Australian developer, the guy who made the first contribution to, to Qt. That it's, Deep inside the bowels, translate key event internal. Call when you have a key event. Let's look at that code again. This looks like key handling code, doesn't it? Key back tab, key escape, and it's calling the dialog default key, probably doing some useful stuff. So what does it do? Well, there's a static int here, which is you know, a beloved tool of the Easter egg writer, because then you can make small changes every time, you, every time you're called. And it brings in the dialog default key uh, function, and then does some weird stuff, and then it calls it down here. Um, the if here is testing TLW, which is saying if it, there's a top-level widget getting the, the key event, and if state zero, but there's something wrong with that zero. It's actually a character. It's ASCII zero, which happens to have the hex code uh, three zero, which happens to have them two bits set, which are the state bits for control and alt. So this is only called if you press control and alt at the same time. Interesting. Now, what are these cases here? It's doing a switch for the key code. And these are actually OSCIEs. They're OSCIEs for O, R, T, L. So these are called if you press O, R, T, and L. That's strange. If you turn those letters around, it turns into something familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> so let's replace that to make it more readable. And then these uh, macros, then they're called with key back tab and key tab, but they have nothing to do with, with the keys. They're actually just hidden codes because these keyboard codes happen then to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, so it's just incremented. And if you do the order, it says T, R, O, and then there's 2 for the L. That's strange. So let's look at the macro. What does it do? Well, it sets this beautiful static uh, variable, and it says that if C equals X, so X is what you're giving the macro, then it increments it by 1. Aha, uh -huh. so if you call it in the right order, it's going to always increment uh, itself if you give it the next code, the next time it is called. Or if not C, so if it's zero when we, when we start off, um, or if the X, the input you're giving it, is 100, then it sets C to 101. So the first time you get the 100 and it brings you up to the 101. Now it's getting interesting. So what it's doing is going through these codes using the macro, and it only works if you do it in the right order, T-R-O-L-L. -L. And then it calls the dialog default key, which we now know is about Qt. So in any Qt application compiled 2.0, if you get key events to a top level widget, you hold Control and Alt in, and you type T-R-O-L-L, -L -L, you get the about Qt dialog box. Isn't that a cool piece of obfuscated code? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And this was uh, in 201, it was uh, uh, defined out by a compiler director, but the code is still there, and it was there until the end of the 230. So all you have to do is change that, that if. So let's have a look here. Uh, I'm going to have to go over. You're a very nice guy, you know. <laughs> Okay, cute, two, three, two. Oh, sorry, I have to remove it first. And now I'm going to go into uh, an example I wrote myself, which was actually the very first cute application. This was implemented uh, when Hovar was in Vienna in the fall of 93. This is the famous Tetrix example. Okay, let's start it here. I find it very hard not to play this when I demo this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. T R O L L. Whoa! Easter egg works. <laughs> There's another Easter egg here which has been there since 090. There's actually an event filter class uh, implemented here that, that's installed, which makes any cute application into an application where you can right click and drag the widgets around. Any application. Isn't that cool? <laughs> oh, this is a bad surface for the mouse. And if you drag them on the outside, it creates a new window. <laughs> mm. And it puts it inside here. And if I X that out, it goes back again. And it's, it works all the time. So that's a very, very old Easter egg. That's back from, from 95. OK, I have one more thing for you. Final Easter egg. In the 4 series, there was also an Easter egg. And it was actually active from 4.0 until end of the 4.4 series. And let's have a look at that. It's a pretty cool one, actually. So I have to make my symlink again with all the different versions of Qt. 420 is what we want. Now we even have a binary directory. So it's actually in the designer. I haven't worked too much on setting up this X server with fonts and stuff, so it doesn't look too good. And it's 800 times 600. But still, if you go in the Qt designer, 4.0 to 4.4, do help. And you do about Qt designer. Then you get this one. And if you go up here to the logo, let's see if I can do this now. And if you click and drag in just the right way, it turns into a button. <laughs> and then you press the button. And presto, Easter egg found. Welcome to the Trolltech business card hunt. <laughs> this is a maze, a pretty big one, containing all the business cards of the people uh, employed by Trolltech at the time. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> so that's what I had for you. Let me just uh, finish off with a photo from the very first developer days. This is the ninth developer days. A lot of things have happened. Uh, the atmosphere is the same. It's very cool to be here. Thank you. <laughs>